Hello and welcome to today's live Writer's Digest webinar titled Self-Publishing 101, What Writers Need to Know to Succeed at Self-Publishing with Vice President and Publisher of Writer's Digest, Phil Sexton, writer, marketer, and president of Book Baby, Stephen Spatz, and New York Times USA Today and Amazon Top 100 best-selling author, Cheryl Holt. Cheryl Holt is a New York Times USA Today and Amazon Top 100 best-selling author of 39 novels. For many years, she was hailed as Queen of Erotic Romance. She's also known as the International Queen of Villains. She has numerous national writing awards to her credit and is particularly proud to have been named Best Storyteller of the Year by Romantic Times Book Reviews magazine. The magazine also selected her as one of the top 25 erotic authors of all time. Stephen Spatz is a writer, marketer, and the president of Book Baby, the nation's leading ebook distributor. His professional writing career began at age 13, paid by a word to bang out little league baseball game stories on the on an ancient manual typewriter for Southern Oregon Weekly Newspapers. After graduation from the University of Oregon, Stephen began a lengthy career in direct marketing with Fortune 500 companies, including Mattel and Hasbro. He joined AVL Digital in 2004 to lead the direct-to-consumer marketing teams for music industry-leading brands, Disc Makers, Oasis, and CD Baby. After serving as Chief Marketing Officer, Spatz was tapped to lead the company's new publishing division, Book Baby, in late 2014. And finally, Phil Sexton is the Vice President and Publisher of Writer's Digest, a division of F&W, a content and e-commerce company. Phil also oversees Blue Ash Publishing, the self-publishing division of Writer's Digest, which combines Book Baby's best-in-class self-publishing services with Writer's Digest education tools and guidance. Phil is the author of four traditionally published books, including The Writer's Lab under the pen name Sexton Burke, and self-published his first book, A Literary Journal, in 2005. Okay, at this point, I'm going to ask you all to unmute yourself, and Phil, I'm going to let you begin, and I won't jump in unless you need me to. Okay, can, uh, can everybody hear me? I want to make sure uh, yep. my... I can hear you, Phil. This is Cheryl. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Okay. Stephen here. All right. Great. Uh, I want to talk just a little bit about kind of the very briefly where self-publishing has come from. You know, self-publishing is nothing new. This slide you can see that there are some very high-profile people who self-published out of either necessity or because that was the way you got published back in the day. And you can kind of see from Margaret Atwood, Charles Dickens, even, even books that are nowadays extremely well-known and considered classics like Leaves of Grass by Walt Whitman. We have Louis L'Amour. We have an Ernest Hemingway. Uh, Irma Rombauer, Joy of Cooking, one of the best-known uh, cookbooks. I'm not sure why there's a witch with a dragon on the front cover, but we're <laughs> going to speak to the importance of cover design. Um, somehow that worked back in the day. I'm not sure it would fly nowadays. Um, and then some more contemporary ones. Um, Wool, obviously, a very important book uh, that really made a mark uh, by Hugh Howey and was kind of a game changer as far as how self-publishing was regarded. Guns by Stephen King, it was something a little off-market for his brand, and so he decided to self-publish it himself. And then here are some really recent books. <coughs> and you can see that <coughs> as far as presentation and cover design, these books are pretty much indistinguishable from things that you would find published from one of the major houses. And that's the big question is that who's next? And you know it's very likely. Could be one of you people uh, listening to us today. So I want to uh, just recap again a couple of our speakers. Um, Cheryl Holt, a best-selling author. Um, the interesting thing about Cheryl's history is that she was successful, very successful, as a traditionally published author. Uh, and she's also been extremely successful as a self-published author. And we're going to talk to her a little bit about that transition, how that happened, her experience in both realms, and, uh, and her feelings about how both of those businesses worked, uh, both positively and negatively. Uh, Cheryl has donated 20 copies of the book you see on the screen here. The, they are uh, signed editions, and we're going to be giving those away to uh, random selection of attendees 
uh, at today's event. So thank you for that, Cheryl. You're welcome. Um, uh, Stephen is uh, president of Book Baby. Uh, Book Baby is one of the uh, premier services out there currently. Um, and you can see on the right, this is a, this is a book that, uh, that Stephen has written. And he's really going to be kind of uh, helping us understand the back end of how self-publishing works. He's also a professional marketer, and he can kind of talk to us about platform and marketing and those sorts of things. It's great to be here. Thank you, Stephen. So let's start with a quote. Uh, you know, self-publishing for a long time was was not particularly well regarded, whether that uh, opinion was was appropriate or not. <coughs> Excuse me, but it's gotten to the point now where this is a quote from John Fine. Uh, up until just a month ago, he was the uh, director for author and publisher relations at Amazon.com, and he made a statement in 2014 that in a few years there will not be a self-publishing and traditional publishing. Uh, those divisions are something we use to kind of figure out how to put people in different buckets currently, but the landscape is changing so fast that in 10 years it's just going to be publishing. And how you choose to publish is really just one option. I mean, there, there are probably going to be 10, 20 different ways to publish your book, one of which may be traditional, and that may not even be the favorite way. Hugh Howey, uh, who I mentioned before, really just put it in these simple terms. You know, how do you want to publish? Do you want to be a small business owner, which would be a self-published author, or do you want to work for a corporation? And he admitted at the time that, you know, how he was going to publish in the future was kind of up in the air. Um, chances are he was going to self-publish because he's had so much success there. But if you know the story of Wool, that started out as a self-published book which he then took to a traditionally, traditional publishing house to do a new print edition for him. So he kind of got the best of both worlds. He got a great revenue stream from his ebook sales, and then he was able to get his book into the trade book market, meaning Barnes & Nobles, all the bookstores, and get an entirely different revenue stream from them, which he hadn't been able to get as a self-published author. So let's talk about basic methods of self-publishing as they exist today. Uh, there's DIY, do it yourself, and this is where you're doing most of the work. You're getting a cover created, you're getting an editor, um, you are building the file for your book and doing the layout, and then you're giving it to either a distributor like Smashwords uh, or CreateSpace or Lulu, uh, or you're giving finished files to a retailer. So that could be Amazon KDP, it could be Nook, it could be Kobo. Partnership publishing is where you're partnering with somebody else. It could be a publisher, it could be an agent, and you're essentially saying, all right, we're going to work on this together. We're not going to pay you anything, but we're going to share the risk of the expense and we're going to share the reward. Um, she writes is, uh, is an interesting one that, uh, uh, that operates like this. Uh, there are quite a few others. Um, diversion books, Cool Guys Publishing is a good one. Um, and then Supported. Supported self-publishing is all fee-based. Anybody can get uh, published through Supported self-publishing. Uh, you're essentially bringing a manuscript to them. You're paying them to do all the work, including any editing you want to buy, design, setup, distribution. Uh, Stephen, just I'm curious, Book Baby you would define as, I mean, I know that you you handle DIY projects, but you also provide some supported services. So you're kind of somewhere in the middle, right? That's correct. I'd say mostly on the supported level, but but there, there is a lot of DIY that goes into this, of course. There's, there's so much work that an author has to do to really get their manuscript ready. Um, so to, to say that even if we want to call ourselves a supported model, to suggest that an author is, doesn't have to do a lot of these, you know, very important chores themselves would be would be wrong. But I would say that mostly Book Baby is is the place where you know authors want to, want to spend the time, you know, looking at their work, making sure their 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 literary work is in great shape, and then they hand it over to companies like like ours and others out there to really do a lot of the technical heavy lifting and the distribution. Yeah, and and a lot of the, the way this is broken down to a degree is depending on your level of comfort. If you are 
uh, comfortable hiring a designer and you're comfortable on, on having a, a work created, uh, if you're comfortable hiring an editor, DIY is, is, a, is a great option. <clears throat> if you want some help doing all that, then support is a great option. Partnership is that interesting kind of middle ground. And I don't think there are quite as many opportunities there, but um, the rate at which these opportunities are growing will probably uh, make that uh, much more common as well. Yeah, there are all kinds of different ways to get involved with self-publishing. It's in contrast with our sister company, the music business, where you know, really how that all came about when independent musicians were empowered to kind of go around labels. Well, there was one place to go. You get your music onto iTunes, you do it such and such a way. It was a very narrowly defined path. I think self-publishing is a much different situation where you know we, we work with authors who – you know, they, they need us to hold. You know, we, we they need us to hold their hand all the way through the process. Or we meet with, you know, work with people who have completely finished files who really just want us to do the distribution work. So there's no one path that fits all. Okay. Very good. And Cheryl, you uh, have published with Book Baby. Um, have you thought of experimenting in any of these other areas, or have you heard feedback from your fellow authors who are also self-publishing about? good experiences or bad experiences one way or the other? Well, um, when I started, I started self-publishing about um, four, three years ago, four years ago, and the world is changing so fast. When I started, I couldn't find copy editors. I couldn't find cover designers, but it's as ebooks have taken off and self-publishing has taken off, there's more people and more people are out of work. They're working at home trying to earn income at home. So it's easier now to find copy editors, to find actual um, content editors to find a cover and people need to think about all those things especially the newer you are as an author you need to think about those things I do it myself because I've been able to find a good cover designer um, I know that book baby uh, supplies those things but I already have those things done when I when I have the book all done I have the cover I have it edited and it's with people that I contracted with that did the work for me and then I go on Book Baby and I just load it and it's ready to distribute. And so the one thing I would uh, warn people about the partnership um, model here, There's I hear horror stories sometimes because um, as, as writers lose their spots with those companies as they downsize, downsize, and it's been happening since the bookstores closed and there's just many, many less spots now for people to write for one of those big publishing companies. And so the agents are losing their agencies too because there's just less money out there to be made from the agency model and so they're they're trying to do things like um, offer editing services offer cover services and so you need to be careful because they're going to want a 15 percent fee which may be good in the beginning if you're not making too much money but let's say all of a sudden you had a hit and you sold 30 or 40 thousand copies of it and then you have to keep giving them 15 percent for the prep work where if you had done it yourself in the beginning and forked out the money in the beginning, maybe the cost of it would have been $1,000. And then all of a sudden you had a big hit, and then you end up paying $8,000, $10,000 out in a, in a continuing 15% fee that you've signed at the beginning because it seemed like a good idea, but maybe later it wasn't. So people need to evaluate those kind of things as they go forward. Okay, very good. <coughs> so let's... Uh move on to this next one. Just a couple other things that people hopefully are aware of. Um, ebook only is really has become kind of the, the favored uh, type of, of self-publishing mainly because with ebook publishing you can get a much broader level of distribution than you can with a print book. And one of the first questions we actually got today was about uh, getting your print book, uh, your self-published print book into bookstores and what costs may be involved. Um, I would say, you know, just to tackle that right away, is that if you're self-publishing a book and you have a print edition of that book, distribution into bookstores is extraordinarily difficult. Um, <coughs> you can go to independent. Are you there? Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. I got, my phone got cut off. So, okay, I'm sorry. I, I missed the last minute. Go ahead. Okay. Um, if you are self-publishing and you have a print book, getting distribution into bookstores is difficult simply because there is no network for independent bookstores to easily buy your books. Um, you know, they're used to buying through catalogs, they're used to having sales reps come into the store, sales reps that they know, who are representing a large number of books. Um, very rarely are they looking to meet a sales rep who's selling one book. 
And that's particularly true with the large chains like Barnes and Noble. At Barnes and Noble, to get a uh, to get a meeting with a buyer for 15 minutes, you usually need to have around five books within the category that they buy for. So to be a self-published author and have one book, you're not going to get a meeting with Barnes and Noble. You might get a meeting with some of your local independents if you get to know them, and they'll probably carry the book for you, um, particularly if it looks really professional. Um, but outside of that, it's difficult. I can tell you of one instance in which I know of a self-published author who did something very creative. Um, his name is Eric Delabar, and uh, he wrote a book called Saltwater Taffy, a book for children. And he was able to convince a distributor, Perseus, uh, to pick up his book and add it to their catalog. So even though it was the only book he'd ever self-published, Perseus carried it as part of their list and they sold it in on his behalf. And he was able to get national distribution simply because he went that route. Now, getting the attention of a distributor for a single self-published book is really hard to do, but I think it's worth trying. I will say in the case of his book, again, really well edited, really well designed, and a great package. Um, so just something to keep in mind. And so I would say that, that's, an, that's an anomaly. I really, I really think that that's a hard thing to do. I mean, it's always nice to try something like that, but very typically if you're self-publishing and the bulk of your sales is eBooks, you're not going to get them into a bookstore. So, so you need to decide in the beginning, what is it, what's your goal? I mean, if your goal is to be in a bookstore, then you need to go to the traditional publishers and try to sell to them. Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, if that is your goal, if you, if that's your if that's your number one thing, I want to be on the shelves in a Barnes and Noble. Then yeah, self publishing is is not going to be for you. And as I said, I mean this, you know, the the other thing to say is that in Eric's case, he created he paid for an entire print run of his book. Um, and most self published authors do not want to do that anymore. Most print books for self publishing are done on print on demand. Um, and yeah. print on demand books will not get sold into bookstores either because they're not returnable. There's no place. And, for well, and I, I would say this too is that I do uh, print versions of my ebooks because I'm self publishing 100% now. I don't have access to the traditional publishers anymore, and I'm completely self published. So I publish my ebooks, and that's where my sales are. I always make a print copy. Because I like to give them away, like in contests, or when I meet a reader, I meet a fan, I like to give them a print copy. But it's really hard when you when you have you, you can't order a thousand books and think that you'll sell them in some way. It does right. the print books. It doesn't happen like that. You'll just have them out in your garage for a long time. So besides the fact that it's really expensive and a big upfront cost, it's just it's hard to move them in any kind of, to any kind of audience. And I have a huge audience and my my print sales are just very small now. And mostly I do the print version, like I said, just so that I can give them away to readers yeah. and give them away in contests. So primarily your print version is a marketing expense. Exactly, exactly. And it's not much of an expense because I do the formatting to have the ebook come out and then it's pretty ready to go as a print book. I mean there's a little bit there's a little bit more formatting and some design changes that have to be done. I have to have a cover jacket made that which goes clear around the whole print book, the front and the back and the spine and those sorts of things. And I pay people to do those things for me, but I look at it as a marketing tool and the thing that new people new writers don't understand and most people don't understand is that a book most of the time is an impulse purchase for the buyer because they're in the store and there's just something about the cover that they see that they like and they put it in their shopping cart. And so when you're not in a store, there's no way for a reader to see your book. And so the impulse sale is gone for you. And so it's really hard once you move to eBooks full time and you're not in the bookstores, it's very difficult to get people to buy the print books because they just don't see them anywhere. And even someone with my big rate of name recognition in the romance industry, people don't go out on the web and go, I've got to find that print book out on the web somewhere. They don't do that. They just download the eBooks. And more and more of my readers are buying Kindles and Nooks every year. And so I have a bigger audience there now than I did even a year ago or two years ago. Sure. Okay, very good. So crowdfunding, uh, I want to keep this moving, so I'm going to kind of jump over crowdfunding, but I think most everyone knows what crowdfunding is, but certainly if you have a platform, and we'll talk a little bit about what platform is down the road here, but if you have an audience, if you have followers, 
perhaps you've been traditionally published in the past and so you know there are people who are interested to see something more from you and you want to fund your self-publishing efforts, a lot of people are turning to crowdfunding uh, to raise money to pay for designers, editors, that sort of thing. We actually had uh, Kickstarter come speak at our last conference um, and that was uh, pretty eye-opening. Uh, I'll just mention this very quickly. When we talk about the ways that people are finding to self-publish, we showed you the three main ones, but I also want you to think outside of that because there are no rules to how to get self-published. There are no set models that you have to follow. And in this case, Michelle Miller was able to convince, convince a venture capital company to back her book which she has been selling in a really unusual way. Um, each book is very, uh, uh, I would say, multimedia. Um, she releases it in an episodic format, with the first one being free, and then charges money after that. So she's been able to build an audience and then sell, as that audience grows, uh, successive chapters of her novel. So really, really interesting experiment. Um, I'll be interested to see how it works. but you know, take it with a grain of salt that the three options we showed you earlier are the methods you have to follow. You can create something of your own uh, and, and see if it works. We want to talk about the indie mindset, how you have to think uh, in, to be successful. Is it different from a traditionally published author? In some ways, no, but in, in a lot of ways, yes. Um, and kind of some of the realities of self-publishing. So first let's talk about how the business works. Traditional publishing, um, obviously very competitive, and it's competitive because there are gatekeepers. There are agents and editors who are essentially saying, I'm the arbiter of taste, and I'm going to decide what this company invests in, what the publisher invests in and decides to publish. Um, so it means you're, you're competing with a bunch of people, not even to... to get in front of a consumer, but just to get through the door. Um, marketing support is possible, but uh, it's not a given. And Cheryl, as far as your experience in traditional publishing, did you get much in the way of marketing support? You're so, you're so funny. That's, that's the most interesting thing to me is that um, a lot of those companies will tell you that marketing doesn't really help books and I it, sell books and I don't know if they say that just so that they they have an excuse to not spend any money on advertising and but I never I wrote for four of the big five publishers and I never had them do any promotion for me at all I was just a genre writer a paperback writer just a paperback writer and that's how I was always treated and there was no money for promotion for me I mean they did go uh, they did go out to the Barnes and Noble sales meetings, you know, and they did pitch me in their romance lines that way, which was what you needed. But, and I had one publisher that used to buy me a half-page ad in a trade magazine, Romantic Times. They used to buy me a half-page ad when I would have a book come out, but that was the extent of any promotion that I ever got from anyone. And um, so I have a whole, I, I have a jump ahead of anyone trying to move into self-publishing because I always had to promote myself. And so I have all these media things in place. You know, I have a huge mailing list that I've been building for years. I have Facebook fan page. I have Twitter fan page. I have all the social media sites. So I have I have regular newsletters that go out. I have all those things in place because I had to do those things when I wrote for the publishers because nobody did them for me. You know, what's what's interesting about that is that a lot of people have said that it's only recently that publishers have really cut back on their marketing for mid-list authors. Um, but well, I, ne I never made it up <laughs> to get any of their advertising money spent on me. So um, I maybe there and and I know now. Um, for example, I I still get notices from Romantic Times magazine, and every month when I get a because they'll say, okay, next you know if you want to buy an ad, whatever, and they always say the publishers are cutting back, cutting back, cutting back. You know if they used to buy you an ad, they're probably not going to buy you an ad now. You need to buy your own. But that other than that one company that bought me ads when I had a book out, I never got any marketing from them. And then I wanted to say one thing about the competitiveness of this. Um, for everyone out there that's a new writer, this was what I didn't really understand when I was beginning as a novelist, because I was a pretty good writer and good at English. I could write good sentences. I had great grammar. And I just thought that I could write any sort of cobbled together book and get it published by one of those companies. And I just didn't have any idea how good the great writers are 
uh, how long they've been at it, how, what great business people they are. I didn't know any of those things, and I thought I could just wander in there and compete with those people. And when I started in the late 90s, I wanted to be a suspense writer, and I didn't even know. I wanted to write romantic suspense, and I was so clueless. I didn't even know that romantic suspense was something that had a name, that was a real thing where an editor would say, is this a romantic suspense? I didn't even know that was a thing that had a name to it. And I was that clueless, but I just thought I could bluster in there and, like, earn a spot next to Tammy Hogue or John Grisham or one of those people. And I don't even think that today I'm a really good writer today. I can put together a really tight story. And I still don't think today that I could wander into the suspense genre and and bluster in and earn a place for myself because it's really that competitive. So I like to tell people you, you don't understand how competitive it is. And the way that you get yourself into that group is by writing and writing and writing and writing and getting your craft good enough that your story can compete with their story. Yeah, very good. I don't think you can say that enough. I mean, <clears throat> whether you're on the traditional publishing side or the indie publishing side, yes. it's, it's a bit of a dogfight. <laughs> Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and sometimes the person with the most content uh, that's good uh, wins. Um, you know, there's a certain amount of discoverability that has to uh, be tied into this competitiveness. And you know, we'll talk about discoverability a little bit later. But um, if you're not seen, you you can't compete. And well, and I wanted to say that too now with the self-publishing. Because it is changing very fast. And when I started three or four years ago, I had quit for a while after the economy crashed. I had just changed publishers. It was supposed to be this huge life chance for me. And they were going to do all this stuff for me. And I was going to finally take off. And then the economy crashed. And the, that first year, all the bookstores closed. All of a sudden, they were paying me way too much money. And I was just out the door. And I thought, OK, I just can't keep doing this anymore. So I quit for about a back in the, the – uh, a, fr a friend of mine said, oh, you should do ebooks because you can just put anything out there and people will buy it. And two or three years ago, that was true. It's not true now. And so if you're going to self-publish, you have to get the product of your book. You have to get the writing as good as the New York published authors, and you have to get the production of the editing and the cover. And all of that stuff has to be as good as a book that you would see from one of the New York New York companies, or people aren't going to buy it. It's very competitive whether you're self-publishing or traditionally publishing. That's right. Um, and in fact, I think that's one of the things, you know, in the earliest slides, when I was showing some examples of self-published books, that last slide I showed, those three books I've seen, you know, uh, in hand, and, and they look as good as anything you're going to get out of New York publishing. Yeah. Um, and I think that's... The, the consumer should not look at your book online and say, oh, that's a self-published book. Exactly. <clears throat> and <clears throat> it's really hard to build a following, and people have so many choices these days that if they read your book and it's full of punctuation errors, it's full of formatting errors, they're not going to buy the next one. They're just not going to because there's just too many books out there now. And so you have to give them from the very first time, you have to give them a quality product. Right. And I will say, you know, one of the ways sometimes people try and get around that is they say, well, I'll give away my book for free. I'll do special marketing to get people to buy it. <clears throat> but the problem is lots and lots of people buy free books. You know, downloading free books to your Kindle or whatever is kind of useless if they never read it. You know, yeah. you're not going to develop a following if the consumer never reads what you've written. So don't depend on, you know, trying to be competitive in the price wars to, to build a following because it's not going to work. Exactly. And when your sales actually finally start to take off as a writer, it's when you start to have enough name recognition that someone read your book and then they see your next one six months later and they liked the first one so much that six months later they still remember your name. And they say, oh, I loved her last book, and so they buy the next one. But you don't get very many chances to give them a bad book. If you give them a bad book, they are not going to remember your name unless it's to remember that they didn't like it, and then when they see your name again, they say, they'll think, I'm not buying that because I didn't like the last one. So no. you have to really make sure that you're ready to put a quality product out there once you have the self-published book ready to go. Yeah. And actually, a little bit later in the presentation, we're going to talk about knowing when your book is ready to go. Good idea, good um, idea. And yeah. let, me tell you, let me tell you one other thing, too, about the competition, and it, this it seems so daunting to me. Um, I read in a news article the other day that there's some group that's always tried to track how many books are in print. 
And 16 years ago, 1999, they estimated that there were about a half million books in print, 500,000 books in print. And today, with this explosion of technology, they estimated last year that there were 29 million books in print now. And so you have to wade out there as a new author, self-published author, into that swimming pool where there's 29 million other books and try to get someone to find yours and buy yours. So you, I know it sounds daunting, but you need to use that as your impetus to get to work and put out a really good product. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> I don't think we need to go through, I mean, the, the bullets are fairly self-explanatory. So let's go to this next slide here. So the more you know, the more you will succeed. So there's a lot of stuff. We can't really cover all of these things in any great depth uh, in this presentation. There are, there are individual presentations we could do on each one. But here's kind of the mindset you have to have when you're, when you're talking about being a self-published author. You need to learn about each of these things, and you need to feel comfortable in <clears throat> working with them and working with either uh, a designer or an editor or an indexer if you're doing nonfiction. Uh, or you have to feel comfortable working uh, with these things with a supporting self-publisher partner. So you need to learn a little about design basics. If you're going to hire a designer, don't just hire someone who knows design. Try and find somebody who knows book design. They're two different things, and book design is a fairly uh, uh, unique uh, skill set. Um, I can't, I can't stress that enough, Phil. That is so, I hear so many people that like use their brother-in-law or ask their sister, or you have to find a book cover designer. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. It's very important. Um, as far as metadata goes, for those of you who don't know what metadata is, it is all of the <clears throat> information about your book that will go into search engines, uh, like the Amazon.com search engine that helps improve your discoverability. Um, so it's going to include the obvious things like cover and maybe a subtitle, author name, but it's also going to include your ISBN, it's going to include descriptive copy, it's going to include uh, BISAC codes, and BISAC codes, I won't get too in-depth on those, but those are book industry study group codes that essentially assign your book to particular categories, and those are your, used when uh, your book is being searched for as well. So you need to learn a little bit about metadata um, and how the power of metadata can affect your discoverability. You need to learn a little bit about sales copy. A lot of people will hire an editor to do the interior of their book, but they'll never hire an editor to actually look at the sales copy. Now, so what do you mean by, do you mean the back cover text when you say sales copy, or what is it that you mean by sales copy? It could copy? be sales copy on a cover. It could be sales copy on Amazon.com. Okay. You know, a lot of people don't, hold their sales copy to the same standard as their fiction or nonfiction. Um, so I think that's important. Um, discoverability, we kind of talked a little bit about that, but it's about all the things that you're doing to make your book easy for the consumer to find. Um, SEO is one of those things. SEO is search engine optimization, and that is how you write copy to incorporate keywords, things that search engines can find easily and it will give your book a higher ranking in search results than other books or other entries that maybe you would come up with on Google. You know, you're going to want to learn about guerrilla marketing, you know, how to get the word out on your book, what's, you know, people talk about social media platforms, what's best, you know, having a really robust Twitter account, having a robust Facebook page, or having 100,000 names in a newsletter or 10,000 names for your newsletter if you're writing that. And, uh, you know, I just last week we were at uh, Digital Book World, which is a big industry event for publishers, and it was made pretty clear that a newsletter trumps everything else. It's very hard to sell through Twitter. But if you've got subscribers who want to hear what you have to say week after week or month after month, a newsletter is the way to go. You and also I, wanna, I, want, I, I just want to underscore that. That is the number one direct marketing tool that you can have. I've had my, I, from the very first day that I started being published, I started building a mailing list. And new writers especially say, well, how, I don't even know how to do that. Well, are you in a writer's group? Start with them. Start with the email, your address book in your email box. You know, just start building one that way. 
and then as you grow and ha and get a newsletter going, I have this is a dedicated list of people who contact me and want to be on my mailing list. So when I send them an email that says I have a new book, they run out and buy it right away. So that's the number one thing that you can do to market yourself and get your sales going is to have a direct mail list that you start building and you should build it from the very first day. And Cheryl, do you also have a blog? No, I don't blog. I don't have enough time to do that. I do have all the social media pages, but I pay someone to do those for me. I have fan pages on all the media sites, but and I have a very uh, updated web page that I keep updated all the time. And but I don't have time to blog. And I I work full time as a writer. It's my home business. And so there's a lot of things I I shift off as soon as I can find something that I can pay someone to do for me. That's what I do because. The number one thing writers need to remember is you need to be writing. And especially the newer you are, writing takes a lot of practice. A novel is a very difficult art form. It takes a long time to learn how to write one and to write it well and then write the next one and it's good and write the next one and it's good. So you need to be writing and writing and writing. And if you're spending all your time on your social media pages, then you're, I think you're focused on the wrong thing. And so I don't blog just because I don't have time because I'm busy writing. Right. Now I, I seem to have lost our question box, so I'm going to actually show part of my lap or my desktop real quick, just to go back and find it. Uh, let's see. Who is uh, that? Is that your daughter? I keep seeing a little girl pop up. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was my daughter. She's, Sorry about that, everybody. She's very cute. Um, yeah, I want to take a break here just to answer a few questions. We've answered some across along the way, but <clears throat> I want to get into a few. Stephen, uh, this one would be for you. Is it mandatory to give a social security number to publish with self-publishing companies? You know what? That's something that I I would have to, I would actually have to defer back to my customer service folks. I, I believe that. Um, you do have to register with us with with some kind of EIN number, um, you know, um, uh, with with Book Bay. But you know what? That's something that if someone wants to email me, I will find Steve, out. I've never, that. I've never, I've never given you my social security number. Well, I didn't the, have a tax the, number, and I didn't, I didn't ever have to answered. file any of. I didn't have to file any of those things with you. Excellent. Then the question is answered. Yes. No. No, you do not. Okay. Thank you, sir. <laughs> And that's why we have two guest speakers. Exactly. Um, uh, you know, one somebody else wrote. Um, they were asking about referrals for self-publishing companies, and while I wouldn't want to give out any specific referrals, I would want to direct people to a good resource out there um, that you can buy. Uh, I think you can get it's an it's an ebook, but I think it's also in a print edition. And this is a it's a good book to have. It's an annual. Uh, essentially like a consumer reports for self-publishing and it's by the Alliance of Independent Authors um, if you know Orna Ross over in the UK she's the one that put this together uh, with Ben Galley and Mick Rooney uh, there's an introduction by Victoria Strauss if any of you read the Writer Beware blog which uh, I think you would be well advised to do if you're not doing uh, she wrote the intro to that and the book is called Choosing a Self-Publishing Service 2014. There will probably be a 2015 edition coming out shortly. But, you know, if you're looking for some guidance on different self-publishing companies to use, that's a great resource. Uh, so I'd, I'm happy to direct you to that. I would say, too, is um, ask people. You know, if you, if you have an author you like and you know they're self-published, just send them an email and say, who do you use? Because that, that, yeah. I'm, I'm nervous sometimes out on the web of contracting with people that I don't know or companies I've never heard of. And so I think it always helps to get a recommendation from a writer that you know or a writer that you like and just ask them who they use. I think that's helpful too. Yeah, word of mouth is, is terrific. Uh, so let's talk about separating fact from fiction. <clears throat> you know, I think when, uh, particularly when the Kindle launched and, and everybody was posting everything their heart desired, um, you know, a flood of ebooks, uh, and a lot of people were buying them, and I think that that gravy train is over with. Um, yeah, Sharon, that ship sailed. Yeah, <laughs> it's gone. earlier about the nature of the competitiveness now, um, 
And I think that can can you speak to that second bullet about ebooks uh, versus printed books as far as marketing goes? Is it the same, or are there things about marketing ebooks that are easier or harder? Well, I you know, and I think that this plays into this sort of mythology that developed three four years ago that you could just put anything out there. And then I was at a writers conference last year where people there there was sort of this mythology that you could just put something up there and because it was an ebook that somehow it was different than a traditional print book that it would like just take off on its own and that there were just all those people out there with Kindles and they would just download and I think people are getting very disappointed with that because they just put stuff up there and then nothing happens and they can't figure it out because there's this folklore going around that you can just make all this money and, and it dates back to those books like Howl and, and, and or Wool and some of those that they did pop out and they did sell a million copies and but that's not happening now because there's so many more books and there's so many more writers so I think that marketing an ebook is exactly the same as marketing a traditional book but in in as far as what you have to do to get it noticed but it's more difficult to get an ebook notice that you publish yourself because the first thing that happens when I started self-publishing was I don't have access to stores anymore. I'm not in Walmart, I'm not in Kmart, I'm not in Barnes and Noble, so no one sees my books there. And so I'm just out on the web, out there on the World Wide Web, trying to get somebody to see my cover when they never see an actual physical copy of the book anywhere. And so it involves, marketing involves all the same things, the direct mailing list, the Facebook fan page, the updated website, just all those things. And then um, you have to do all those things ten times more because you're not in the store where somebody would actually see the physical book. And um, I was at a conference last year where, where some writer who's making millions doing this, she was like, oh, you know, I just put it up and if you sell one a day, that's like $700 in a year and then that's probably what you would have gotten as an advance from one of those New York companies, you know. So it's even Stephen and I was thinking, well, don't you want to aim a little higher than, you know, you work on a book for a year and then you make $700? I don't know. I want to, I want to sell more than one a day. So you really have to go after it. And I, I um, Phil, I was, think I was telling you the other day when we were talking um, in prep for this, I have a big trilogy coming this summer, and they're going to come out June, July, and August. And so I just had a big trilogy launch on January 15th, and I started telling people in November, I'm going to have a trilogy launch on January 15th. Visit my fan page and see the new covers. Watch the new book trailer. Um, see that you know, read read a sample chapter of the new books. Blah blah blah. And then, so I had a couple months to tell people to come and see the new covers. And then I have all spring where I'm going to send out notices to this direct mail list and out on blog sites that say, I have a big trilogy coming in June. And then in in May, the month before the first one comes. I'm doing a scavenger hunt where I'm going to be out on blogs every day. I'm just doing a million things. And all through the spring, I'm going to be sending out notices to people and doing things saying, I have a book coming in June. I have a book coming in June. Because even with my acclaim and my name recognition, if I didn't do that, it would just vanish into this ether of 29 million books. So the marketing is the same as you would do it for a traditional publisher, but you have to do more and you have to be really intense about it. Yeah. Um, you know, the other bullets on here I think we've already addressed, uh, and so I'm going to answer a couple more questions uh, while we're in the thick of that. Um, one question is, is it fine to just self-publish right to Amazon and do all the work yourself, or you, do you specifically suggest that we use a self-publishing company? Um, we kind of talked about that, and I think it all depends on what you're comfortable with. I think if you are comfortable with uh, handling, getting a cover designed yourself, if you're comfortable arranging for the editing, um, then you can publish right to Amazon or, or any other uh, uh, retailer or wholesaler that, that handles a DIY project. I think if you're uncomfortable managing those things yourself, and managing payment to those people, then you would want to consider some sort of supported self-publishing. Well, and I was going to say too is, you know, I suppose kind of some of it's a generational thing with me too is that you can put books up yourself, like on Kindle or whatever, but I am just such a computer feeb that I start trying to use some loading process and I can't figure it out. And so I, I, when I found Book Baby, I, I met them at a conference, at a vendor room at a conference one day, and it was just this godsend to me because I was like, I can't go on a computer site and figure out the formatting process. I don't get it. I don't understand it. I'm not very adept with computers. 
and just kind of use mine as a glorified typewriter. So to find a company like BookBaby, that I just send the stuff to them and I say, do just say, please format this for me and send it out to these places and then I don't have to try to figure it out myself because that's very difficult for me. And, you know, there's one other thing on this, this screen I wanted to talk about um, and that was that um, you need to decide what it is that you can do on your own because one of the things when I wrote for the traditional publishers, they did the cover, they did the editing, they had proofreaders, they had all, all those things and so all of those things now are on my desk and I either have to pay for them or I have to do them myself. And then there, it becomes this juggling act of, okay, if I do it myself, that's time I'm not writing. If I'm proofreading this formatting, then I'm not writing. And my main focus is writing because that's how I generate my income is writing. And so I was thinking about at one of the earlier screens, you said this woman had like this book with audio and video and there was going to be on a website. And so you have to start to balance those things and say, how much of that can you do? How complex do you want to make the process? And then what can you shove off to other people and what can you afford to pay for so that you don't have to do some of those things yourself? But it, it just, when you start thinking about marketing or you start thinking about the editing process, anytime you do one of those things yourself, then it takes time away from your writing. So you have to start juggling these ideas and figure out how you can get enough time at your computer to get the books done and get them into good shape and then what you can still do in, as far as editing or whatever that and what do you need to ship out so that you are still writing and keeping your focus where it needs to be. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Um, all right, next question we had is um, should self-published authors get book blurbs and where can they be found? Um, First question, uh, should you get a book blurb? Yes. Um, I think that's a great idea. I think anything you can do like that will, will help motivate a consumer to take your book seriously. Um, as to where they can be found, um, you know, Cheryl, I don't know if you get blurbs for your books, but I mean, I think really it's, it's to a large part about networking and uh, getting to know other authors. Now, um, what do you mean, what do you mean with a blurb like that? I would have someone quote or talk about it? What are, what are you, yeah, what my, do you my mean? Impression, my impression from this, from this question is that they're looking for quotes. Oh, okay. Well, um, the way that <laughs> I've, I've given dozens of authors quotes, I've given hundreds of authors quotes in my life, the way that usually happens is that somebody just asks me. It, you know, lots of times it's a publisher, it's an editor I know, it's a lot of times my agents would ask me if I would do it for another author and so that's how they're done is you just ask somebody and so I get requests a lot most times I turn it down just because I don't have time to read somebody's book is my problem and so um, but every once in a while I'll say yes but that's how you get a blurb is you just write to the person you want the blurb from and say would you read my book and give me a blurb and then see if you, you can get a quote from them but don't be upset if you ask a busy author and they don't have time don't be upset about that it's just a time constraint and it just takes a while to read a book and you know, you just, you just really get dragged in if you say yes all the times that you get asked. But that's how you do it is to just ask somebody. But I, I think um, there's, there's just so many ways to get people talking about your books. And you need to just be creative and find as many of them as you can. And I struggle with it all the time. You know, like there's these huge reader websites like Goodreads or Night Owl Reviews or all these places and so you have to wonder should I buy an ad it, it, then you know I'll have you know for a month I'll have the, my cover out on this big page but I don't I don't know and, and we're getting better marketing tools that you can sign up for that show you you know like if you buy an ad at this site you know did you sell any books the next day and that kind of stuff or I don't usually track stuff like that I, it's too exhausting to me to be so meticulous about it but there's so many ways that you can get things out there more than just a blurb I think you want your cover out there I think you want it to be cover colorful and eye-catching that's what makes people notice your book is if they look at the cover they like the cover I think you need great back cover text because if you can get somebody to look at the cover what you want is them to like the cover enough that they will read the back cover text and then so you want the back cover text to be very concise to be very creative and to make them go oh I think I'd like to read that book 
from, you know, the two paragraphs that are on the back cover. And so, and you need to do that even if you're just doing a book, doing an ebook, you have to write some back cover text to put up on the, on the Kindle sites or wherever so people can see very concisely what it's about. So there's a lot of ways to get people to see the book, but it's choices of what you have to do. Whether or not blurbs work in my own personal life, I have never gone, I have never looked at a book and said, oh, John Smith, the New York Times best-selling author, says this is great, so I'm going to go buy it. But, I mean, publishers do that all the time, but for me as a reader, that has never made me run out and buy a book because some famous person said it was good. Yeah. You know, one, one thing I want to add to that is when we're talking about blurbs and how to get blurbs, you know, a lot of it comes down to networking. It comes yeah. down to getting to know different authors, particularly if you have a lot of friends that authors and one of them takes off, you know, leverage them to give you a blurb. But I think for nonfiction authors, there's something even more important than a book blurb, and that is a foreword. Um, yeah. And I'll explain why. If, if you're writing nonfiction and you can network with people who are experts in the field that you're writing about, getting them to write a foreword does more than just get their name on the front of your book. They're then considered in the industry a contributor to your book. And contributors are a metadata field. We talked about metadata earlier. A blurb, per, uh, someone who gives you a blurb is not considered uh, a metadata field. But someone who writes a foreword goes into your metadata. So if someone's on Amazon and searches for that person, your book will come up in that search. So it's kind of an interesting thing where I'll give you an example that Writer's Digest has actually done uh, as well. We did um, a book, uh, it was a, actually an annotated edition of Dracula where uh, we had an author, uh, Mort Castle, who's a, a, a Bram Stoker award winner. Uh, he went through the book and did all sorts of annotations about what Bram Stoker was doing in the text itself from a writing point of view. So it was meant to be educational for writers. But Mort is not that big of a name. Not that many people search for Mort. However, we contacted New York Times bestselling author Jonathan Mayberry to write a foreword to that book for us. And the great thing about that is that when someone searches for Jonathan, our Dracula book comes up. So if you're writing nonfiction, um, just consider that. Uh, I think forwards can be, can be very helpful from a discoverability point of view. Um, let's move along a little further here. Um, as far as like expenses related to self-publishing, we talked about competition. Uh, we talked about the necessity of having well-edited content, uh, having a great cover. And from a, from a standpoint of editing versus design, um, obviously everything is important and you want it to be as perfect as you can get, but obviously we're also working with limited budgets. Um, Cheryl, from your point of view, and, and Stephen, I don't know if you have some insights into this as well, what do you think is most important for a book's success? Uh, superior editing, superior design, what's the right mix if you're on a budget? I think writing a great story I think it starts with a great story. That's why I just always try to impress on new writers that you have to write and write and write. It just takes years of practice to get good at it. And I think it's the story. I think it all starts with the story, and then we move out from there. And so I think the first, the very first thing you have to focus on is the story and making sure that you have a great story with great characters and great plot lines and great settings and just all that stuff. And then. I think it's a I think it's a mix of all those things because you can have the greatest story in the world. If I start if I start reading the book, oh, I think we lost Cheryl. I think we did lose Cheryl first. Let me let me let me pick that up from there. I, I would agree with Cheryl that you know that um, the the getting ah. the words right would be the first priority. Um, and and if, if, if you had to have a choice, yes, I would say that editing is probably your number one um, item where, where you would you would spend the discretionary money on. Yeah, I think, I mean, I would agree with that too because I think we all feel like when we're writing something, we're writing it because we think it's a great story. You know, we think they're yeah. great characters, but you need that objective third party to come in and say, yeah, you know, this secondary character here is pretty weak, and so that makes this part of your plot not work very well. 
You're too close to it at times. That's right. Exactly. Yes. So as far as uh, you know, as far as price ranges go for what people would pay for good editing, um, Stephen, do you have a sense based on? I mean, I, obviously you guys charge for editing. You know, we have a service where we charge for editing. There are freelance editors. Uh, it, do you feel like there's a, a range and and what is sensible? to pay for editing and what is not? Well, you know, we, we actually refer people to outside editors. We, we, we don't get involved with the actual creative process. And there, there are a lot of different kinds of editors, anywhere from copy editing to, to content to plot development. You know, you really have to shop around. Um, I, I, guess, I guess what, what is most you know, critical is to make sure that you have an editor that, that, that fits you. It's not a retired English teacher, not that I don't like retired English teachers, but they may not be the most qualified to edit your, you know, thriller uh, novel. So to, to really, you know, think, think carefully about who it is, get, get references, um, you know, the Editorial Freelance Association, I, I believe it's called, to, to me is one of, the, one of the best groups that has such a, a wide and varied population of editors. And, and their prices will be all, all over the board, but, you know, the, the, the money that I've spent in editing my, my own book, I thought it was the, the best money that I spent for the, for the entire um, project. Yeah, and I was going to say, I don't know what general content editors, if you're a new writer, if, if you have a traditional publisher, they'll edit for you, and you'll have an editor to edit the story and help you make changes. You know, it's like the trees in the forest thing and, and changing things around for you. If you're doing it yourself and you're new, you should probably hire a content editor. I don't know what they charge because I have a really good feel for story now because I've been doing books for a long time. So I don't need someone to tell me that I that – one of the plot lines isn't coming through or it's not meeting up at the right place. I don't need those things. But I do hire copy editors. And I was going to say the going rate these days is about a dollar a page. So if you have a 400-page manuscript, the copy editor checks the punctuation. That's what she does. Or, or finds mistakes. Like I had one the other day. She said, you said this woman is this guy's daughter, but she's too old to be his daughter or some, something like that. So she catches mistakes like that. So the going rate for that is about a dollar a page. So on a 400-page manuscript, it would be $400 just to have the punctuation checked. I pay $150 for my covers. So if I have a trilogy, I have the covers made all at once. It costs me $450 to get the three covers done. Okay. Wow. Right. But that's the go that's a very competitive rate. Yeah. If, if people are shopping, because when I started a couple of years ago, I mean, I'd have these people that would want thousands of dollars to do the cover. So don't pay that. That's not you don't want to do that. It's not no. it's not competitive. Let me let me ask one thing while we're talking about design. Let me ask this regarding um, or I'm sorry, not design but editing. Let me ask this, and that is it's something I've built later into the presentation, but I think it's worth talking about now. Um, you know, one of the things about traditional publishing is that you have an objective, an objective third party who is editing your book. You're not paying them, and so there's no resistance, typically, to having them come back and push you a few times to get it exactly right. Um, whereas when you're hiring your own editor, sometimes you're constrained by a budget. Sometimes, you know, they may give you a first pass and give it back to you, and that's all you can afford. Mm -hmm when in fact there may be more work to be done, but you would have to pay for that. Um, at what point do you know that the book is right, or do you? Oh, that's a hard question. I don't think you ever know that it's right, and what I would say is the newer I was as a writer, the better I thought my books were, and then as I got more experienced as a writer, then I started to question more whether they're right. <laughs> and um, So I think it's a really hard question. What I would say is I just could I could start to tell when my books got better just because I would have more characters and I would have more emotional plot lines and more emotional issues and the big black moment going into the third act would be so dramatic and I could tell they were getting better that way. But um, it, I just think that's a hard thing because it's, it's art. That's what we forget about novels, that this is an art form. It's writing as a craft. And I will put a book out there. And I'll, have, I'll get letters from people that say, I've read all your books, this is your best one. I'll get letters from people that say, I've read all your books, this is your worst one. And so I think it's really hard to tell, even at my stage. Right. And, and I will say that there are plenty of books that come out of traditional publishing which are bad. 
Yes, you know? that's true. <laughs> so it's not like that is the uh, that is the salve for all wounds. I mean, it, it's you know. Well, and that's the way that's their business setup too. Because once you start working for one of those companies, typically once they've bought a book or two from you, you don't submit the book after that. You just send them a proposal. You'll send them an eight or ten page story proposal, and they just go forward with that. And uh, the more experienced you get, you, you're always pretty sure that you can get to the end and it'll be a pretty good book. But even at my age, at my stage of it, sometimes I get into the book and it, it's not going to come out right from where you started with this H page synopsis. So that's how, that's why you get books from the traditional publishers that are not that great because that business model is once you've submitted a few books and they know you can finish it, they'll buy the third or fourth one, they'll start buying that way just off a of synopsis. And so they don't see the finished product until you turn it in on the due date. And so, and sometimes because it's art and it's a writing as a craft, sometimes a, a, this little eight page synopsis sounds good, but when you, when you stretch it out to a 400 page book, it's not so good anymore. So, and some ideas don't work as well as you thought they were going to work. So yep. it, that's why you get books that you're like, oh, how'd that get published? <laughs> You know, and not that I would recommend that people just go out and, and throw anything out there as we as we've talked about before, but we have authors who contacted Book Baby four years ago and they say, Oh, I'm close to getting my book done, I'm almost there, I'm almost there <laughs> and they, they just won't turn loose of it. And you know, our our philosophy to, to recommend we don't we don't do a lot of recommendations, but we do say, Look, just turn turn it loose, get it out there. It's never gonna be perfect. But if you're gonna stay on the same story, on the same just trying to, to make it, you know, one tenth of a percent better each and every month you, you get to it, you'll you'll never get it out there. So you know what? Publish it, go on to your next story, learn. Because you'll That's learn right. a lot about the process then you learn you, know. you get better and you get better each time that you write a new book is the thing. And the other the other part I would say about that, I see a lot of people in writers groups that are in critique groups or have critique partners and they will rewrite the first three chapters over and over and over and have the have the first three chapters critiqued 40 times and they never get to the end or they don't know how to write the whole thing because the first three chapters are really good but the rest not so much so my advice is sit down write the rough draft from the beginning to the end because you don't really know who the characters are until you're at the end you, you think you do at the beginning but you don't know who they are until you you write the last word and the last page so my advice to new writers is write the whole thing then go back and start editing and and you're absolutely right and then get it off your desk and get to the next one because each time you start a new one and finish one you get much better otherwise if, if you're just rewriting the same thing it'll be like Groundhog Day oh yeah, there you go. <laughs> it is Groundhog Day so we are um, you know there's a bit left of, of the deck to share um, but it's a little past two already. <clears throat> so what I'd like to do, I want to talk very briefly about uh, platform. Um, I will go ahead and uh, we'll take questions for uh, another five, ten minutes. And uh, then I would just say if anybody wants the deck, um, you can email us or you can email me directly. Um, my email address is, I'll just write it down here. Uh, it's P-H-I-L dot S-E-X-T-O-N as in Nathan at F as in Frank W community dot com. So it's Phil dot Sexton at F-W community dot com. So if you email me and you want the deck I'll just send it to you and um, any questions that we are unable to answer before we have to jump off um, we'll make sure to answer those as well, and we'll send those out uh, with the thank you for attending email. Uh, so this bit here, just in terms of platform, you know, one of the things we talked about was social media. We talked about building a newsletter. Um, for those of you who don't know, we, I just want to define platform really quickly. Platform can be considered in two different ways. One, it's who you are. What is your reputation? How do people know you? If you're writing a book on how to take care of dogs, you should probably be a dog trainer or a veterinarian, that sort of thing. Um, you know, instead of a construction worker, just saying. Um, the other piece of this, though, is the network you build. And when we talk about network, we're talking about friends, we're talking about supporters, but you're also talking about these other two very important things, evangelists and potential customers, people who are going to support what you're doing by buying your work and then who are going to go out and tell everybody else about how good your work is. Um, and that takes a lot of time 
It takes creating a lot of content for those people, maybe free chapters to review, maybe uh, you know content for your newsletter, um, and it could take money. Obviously, Cheryl, you know you're employing people to manage you know part of your social media presence. Yeah. Before you got to that point, I mean, obviously, when you were with a traditional publishing house, you probably developed an audience there, and they may have followed you mm -hmm. when you started to launch a self-publishing uh, line. Uh, Actually, I had to rebuild my fan base. My, what I found out when I went to publishing ebooks is my fan base is older romance readers, and they were just adamantly opposed and said they would never buy e readers. That is changing now, though, as more and more bookstores close. More of my old fans are coming back, but I had to build a new fan base out there on, on the internet because my, my readers were diehard print book readers, but there, more of them are coming around now just because there's no bookstores anymore. Okay. Um, any any advice for someone who's maybe starting from zero? <laughs> um, I would say there's two ways to become a great novelist. One is you have to write all the time, and one is that you have to read all the time. And I don't know why it works that way, but if you don't read all the time, you will never be a great novelist. And so you should read everything Every bestseller, you should read every, like go once a month to the library, check out Publishers Weekly Magazine, read all the starred reviewed books. You should read every novel that comes out that's peripherally related to what you're doing, murder, love, police, whatever, and read all the time. You should always have a book in your hand, and then you should be writing every single second that you can write. That's how you get great at it. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's, let's go to some questions. Uh, and we'll just do this for the next, maybe, let's say, till a quarter after. Is that okay with, with you two? Yeah, that's Great. fine. Um, so question. Random House published my first novel. It was a literary novel. After I submitted it over the transom, if I now publish my second novel <coughs> with Book Tango, will I still have any hope of publishing with the traditional publisher? Yes. There you go. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I they, they look at book by book by book, and so if you submit another one that and they liked it, they would buy it. But those companies, it's very very hard to get those companies to to buy a book from you, especially the newer you are, the less likely it is to sell to one of them. It's really really competitive. And we're getting some success stories of again people who start with us and who get noticed because of sales, because of activity, you know, in the community, and they get picked up. By, yeah. by the big publishing house. We've had you know, many of these people start with us at Book Baby and graduate on to the traditionally published people, and we applaud them and wave, wave them happily on their way. Yeah. Well, now, I don't mean to sound snarky, but that's very typical that those publishers would let a writer do all the work and build some <laughs> name recognition, and then, then the publisher snatches them up. That's very typical. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, and it's very true. But, you know, the, the interesting thing is it, it also works the opposite way. You know, I've had some situations where we've had some authors get so big and build such a following that they came to realize that if they if they self-published, they might be able to make more money. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, so it's it's this interesting which which actually takes us all the way back to the beginning uh, with that quote from John Fine of Amazon, where he said, ten years from now, there's not going to be self-publishing or publishing; it's just publishing, and you may have the opportunity to publish one book traditionally because that's right for that book. And you may have the opportunity where you may decide to self-publish a different book mm -hmm. simply because that's the right way for that book. Um, well, I was going to say too, what new writers don't understand is those companies, the traditional publishers, they keep 94% of the money. You get 6% of the, you get 6 of the money. So um, that used to be a lot of money for me when there were a lot of bookstores everywhere, but there's not a lot of bookstores left anymore. So the print runs are much like a tenth of what they used to be when I was at the height of my paperback power and writing for those companies. So the money has really fallen for writers that are writing for those companies. So it's yeah. something to think about. Yeah. In fact, you know, there are some, uh, some hybrid publishers. You know, everybody's trying to find a new business model that works. And there are some hybrid publishers who, are, uh, who will offer, say, no advance, but yeah. a much bigger royalty uh -huh. um, and more control. You know, publishers, I think, are getting to that point where they have to be uh, willing to experiment with their traditional business models because the traditional business model is not, frankly, uh, as good for anybody at this point anymore. 
Yeah, so. and I, I, they're very, I always call them dinosaur companies. They move very slowly. <laughs> they make very conservative decisions. And I think they're getting caught up. It's like the blockbuster Kodak thing is, I don't know that they have the business model in place to make fast decisions and change as fast as the lightning speed of that life is changing. So I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> Well, you know, it's interesting because I think I think you're right. I think the the larger publishers are sometimes it's a little more difficult for them to change. Writers Digest is actually a fairly small publishing house. Um, yeah. You know, we do these eight market books every year, which are fairly big books. They're a little like you know phone books, and then we do about 16 traditional writing reference books. And because we're smaller, we can move pretty quick. Um, yeah. And it's it's hugely beneficial because frankly we're trying to get ahead of the changes that are happening and and offer different kinds of contracts um, and frankly we have to because our writers are much better educated than a lot of other writers out there. You um, guys publish you still publish a lot of how to books right of how to write how how the business works. I just yeah. really recommend those to new writers that are out there is check out the books that Writers Digest publishes. They're very helpful when you're new. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, oh, and I would also say, too, is if you live somewhere where you can get in a writer's group, start at your local library, join a local chapter of Romance Writers of America. Even if you don't write romances, it's all the same process. Because I like to do everything the hard way, so I never was in a writer's group or never had a, a mentor or a critique partner. But it's very helpful. It's a great way to learn about the business. They bring in speakers. Um, go to writer's conferences. All the big editors and agents come to the writer's conferences, and you can schedule a pitch session. And so there's all kinds of things that you can do if you join a writer's group, all kinds of things that you can learn. It's a great way to get started. Yeah, yeah, very good. Um, let's see, two, I think we've, we're, it's about 13 minutes after, so let's take just a couple more questions. <clears throat> One says, let's see here. Um, there's a question here about cover design, so let's talk about that real quick. Are there any tips for cover design? We talked about that, but they ask, is it better to have a professional company design a cover, or is it possible to design your own if you have experience in graphic design? Uh, I would say hire a pro. Yeah. Um, Having an experience a book, in graphic a book design, cover design, a book, a book cover bro, design. Right. And if you if you're determined, if you're broke and you want to, you need to just, you know, it's a, a money thing, and you need to do it yourself. You need to go out, get out on the web, and look at a hundred books that are in your subgenre. Yeah. And look at them and see what they look like before you try to design one. Make sure you know what they look like so that because it targets the audience when they see the cover. You don't want to put a crime cover on there when it's a romance, when you want to attract a romance audience. So you need go out and look at 100 covers that are in your subgenre so you know what they look like. Visual yeah. cues, absolutely. You want to stand out, but you don't want to stand out with a, you're right, a crime cover in a, in yes. a romance book. <laughs> well, I, think, you know, I think that's the thing, is that you don't want to confuse your audience. Your cover is making some sort of promise to the audience yes. as as what it's going to be. And yeah. then, so you kind of need to try and stick to that and stand out. It's a tough balance to keep, but you know, you've got to try. The, there's a second part to that question that says, I've noticed the books that wind up on the New York Times bestseller list don't have people on their covers. Is there anything to that, or is it just my impression? Um, <clears throat> I think that just, you know, I don't think there's any rule about, you know, people on the covers uh, necessarily helping sales unless it's in a particular category. In romance, it helps because we have these mega, mega cover models that are so famous. Some of these male models are so famous. So if you can get one of them on your cover, people will buy the book. Romance readers will buy the book just because this guy is on the cover. So that's how, that's why we have these guys. Besides that, women just love these great chests. <laughs> right. Uh, let's see. And just one last one. Um, somebody asked, uh, let's see. What about getting your books in libraries? Oh. Um, that's an excellent question. If you know, that's the same trouble. That's the same trouble as um, trying to get them into bookstores. Is that you really need to have a traditional publisher to get your books into a library? But I love having my books in a library because they just end up all over, and I love having them in garage sales too because they end up all over. <laughs> yeah. 
And I believe that um, there is a service out there. I'm trying to remember the name of it. Um, oh, I think it's Library Journal. Uh -huh. um, I believe Library Journal has created a service where if you submit your book to them for review, um, they don't they don't allow everything in. But if you submit your book to them for review, they will get the ebook distributed to libraries. But the problem is there is no revenue involved. That's right. Yeah. So it is purely for distribution and exposure. exposure. Yeah, and, and I won't do it for free because the whole reason I do this is for money. I live in Los Angeles. If I have a Los Angeles mortgage, I'm doing it for money. So <laughs> <laughs> to tell me I can do something free, that just doesn't appeal to me at all. So, and I hope, and I think money, we attach money to success. And so everybody out there, I hope that you want to do it for money and actually make your life better. It's a great, it's a great way to do it. And I think we're kind of wrapping up. I wanted to say one other kind of a closing thing. And that was out there where there's now 29 million books out there. There's a two part process to selling your book. Cause first you have to write it. You have to make it great, but you have to ask two questions. How can I get someone to find my book? And then how can I get them to buy it? It's never enough that they find it. They can see your cover, they can like your cover. If they don't like the back cover text or just whatever, they won't buy it. So how do you get them to find it? How do you get them to buy it? And it's a great life, especially me. You know, I was always able to work at home with my kids. And so it was a great uh, subsidiary income for me. And then after my 13th book, I was able, I made enough money to be home full-time and just write full-time. And I've been doing that for about 10 years now. And it's a really great life. So I really encourage people and it's easier now than ever because you can publish your own books. You don't have to wait for those companies to say that they'll publish you. You don't have to wait for a gatekeeper to tell you it's okay. You can put it up yourself, but you really need to learn the business and become a very savvy small business owner doing it in your own house. Right. Very good. So, nice way to wrap up. Okay, um, good. All right. Well, we are out of time. We went uh, a little ways over, but I want to reiterate, if you submitted questions, we have a lot of questions, and if we didn't get to them, um, we will answer those, um, and those will go out in a later email, uh, as uh, along with the uh, notification of uh, winners of the book giveaway. So thank you for listening, um, and you'll get, uh, you'll get the emails, I think, uh, in, a, in a week or so um, with this recording as well. So, and thank you to our uh, two guest speakers. Really appreciate it. And thanks, thanks to everybody much. for listening. I'm so, I'm grateful that you think I had something worth saying. Thank you for listening. <laughs> All right. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.